Hi, my name's Phil, and I like talking about politics. So the winner of the poll today was, what alternatives do the Tories think they have for the backstop? So Theresa May is going back to the EU in order to try and persuade the council to reopen negotiations on the premise that there are alternative solutions to the backstop. Now, before going through these proposals, I have to say that neither myself nor, as it turns out, EU leaders believe that Theresa May has really come to Brussels in order to try and get the agreement changed. You know, indeed, in interviews, they've been saying this is clearly about her trying to stop her party splitting. Now, apart from anything else, Theresa May has publicly said many times that the backstop is essential for security in Northern Ireland. Both the UK and the EU share a profound responsibility to ensure the preservation of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, protecting the hard-won peace and stability in Northern Ireland, and ensuring that life continues essentially as it does now. We agree that our future economic partnership should provide for solutions to the unique circumstances in Northern Ireland in the long term. And while we are both committed to ensuring that this future relationship is in place by the end of the implementation period, we accept that there is a chance that there may be a gap between the two. This is what creates the need for a backstop to ensure that if such a temporary gap were ever to arise, there would be no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, or indeed anything that would threaten the integrity of our precious union. Uh, she quite clearly stated some months ago that if there were ever a hard border appeared uh, in Northern Ireland, or the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, that that would be a breach of the Good Friday Agreement. It, you know, it's not something that, as far as she's concerned, is even a, a legal point of debate. She's just saying straight up it would be. In addition, the withdrawal agreement doesn't actually need changing to include alternative solutions because it's already mentioned in there. You know, in fact, the backstop only comes into effect in the absence of a solution being applied by the end of the transition period. The default position with the current agreement, it basically assumes that a solution will be found even though two years of investigating it have come up with nothing. Theresa May knows this, of course she does, uh, which is why ne UK negotiators came up with the version of the backstop that we have that was actually rejected by Parliament. This is why members of the EU are not really playing ball. They're not interested in going through the motions of pretending to negotiate when everyone involved knows full well what the situation is, including Theresa May and including all those MPs. Or maybe there's a few thick ones that don't really know what's going on. They don't care whether the Conservatives unite or split. Why should they? In fact, as the only major party that ever bashes the EU in the UK, why should they help them at all? So the first proposal was pushed by a collaboration, quite a lot of Conservative MPs, which included Nicky Morgan, who is a Remainer, and Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is a Brexiteer. It suggests a combination of tariff-free trade and technology. It's known as the Malthouse Compromise, and I mentioned it recently. By the way, people have been expressing a little bit of confusion as to the naming of some of these proposals. This one is called the Malthouse Compromise because it was pushed forward by an MP called Kit Malthouse. You know, although the meat of it was written by another MP like Steve Baker. But the Chequers Agreement is called the Chequers Agreement because the agreement for it in Cabinet, or otherwise, took place at Chequers, which is the residence for the Prime Minister in the countries where she can hold meetings away from the public glare. So, you know, that's how these things are usually just named, even though if that's not their official name. Now, on the technology side of things, this is a word thrown around by a lot of people who are trying to convince us that the answers are there. I mean, technology exists. That's one thing the Brexiteers are not making up. And if we can put a man on the moon, surely there's no limit to what technology can do, at least in most people's minds. However, during the two-year negotiations, people representing both the UK and the rest of the EU investigated technological solutions in operations on, on borders around the world. On every border in the world, they try to find out what solutions are used. I mean, for anything, obviously the solution we need, the problem doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. But they were investigating what is actually used uh, that might offer a solution to the Irish border problem. The thing is, technology could form part of a solution because there are some things it can do. And the Republic of Ireland is the most desperate to find a solution. And they have been searching, believe you me. We should be equally desperate, of course, but we're a bit blind to the realities of the situation, rather annoyingly. So at the moment, there are about 2 million heavy goods vehicle crossings 
across that Irish border, a year. Now, you would think if a suitable solution did present itself, that actually may increase because that would then be a really good route to trade between the UK and the EU for certain goods at any rate. Now, there have been suggestions that what you could do rather than checking the things on the border is you check it somewhere else. But that still means physical checks being made. And I'm not quite sure how shifting the location helps. Surely doing so only makes it more difficult to track things between the two countries. I mean, the border is where you need to do the checks. Now, new technology is always being developed and there are a number of proposed systems which might help with the issue in the future. But some of the technology being referred to hasn't even been tested yet, let alone perfected and implemented anywhere in the world. And I know, and this is the thing, this is where some people will be with the technology. They'll think to themselves, well, why don't we just test it? Why don't we just try it in Northern Ireland? It's not there to try yet. It's a little bit like you've got companies that have plans to send people to Mars. But that doesn't mean to say we can send someone to Mars tomorrow. They're not there yet. They may not be there for 50 years. And it's the same with this technology. In the future, yes, it may well be that we don't need physical checks. But that is not only not now, it's not anytime soon. It is entirely possible that when it does arrive that the, the Irish border will be the first to use it. But it is not going to be there for when the proposed transition is over. And it's not going to be there anytime soon after that either. And when it does come into use, if it comes into use, then it would just replace the backstop anyway. Now, in terms of what is available, so X-ray scanners, these have been used on various borders around the world. Um, I'm guessing there isn't a serious safety issue with them because there are borders that use them a lot. But they don't work like Superman's X-ray vision that you see in the films. It can't be used to really see properly what's in a vehicle. It just tells them something about the different densities of materials inside it. Now, where you've got a good contrast and a distinctive shape of something, yes, you can make out an object. But you can't tell anything about the quality of the product, even if you can identify the product. And an awful lot of the products in these vans, you wouldn't even be able to identify it from an X-ray scanner. Um, and I think people think that modern scanners can do all these amazing things, probably because they sort of look at what you've got in that most security conscious of nations, the United States, and particularly in the airports. But the thing is, although there are scanners in airports, um, quite a few of the scanners in US airports are really placebos just to make people feel better in the wake of 9-11. They don't really do anything. Um, so, you know, we don't have these marvellous scanners. An x-ray is just an x-ray. Um, so they might be able to identify some cargo, but yeah, they can't check the quality of it. And that's essential if you're not going to have regulatory alignment. If we end up with different standards to the EU, then each of us needs to check the quality of the goods coming into our respective territories to make sure it meets up to ours or their standards. Now, on security issues, you can, of course, have number plate recognition systems. That's fine for vehicles that have been known to take part in criminal activity. You know, that can be on a database, yeah. You could use drones, but all that can really do is monitor traffic flow. And even then, that might be a bit sensitive because some people may fear that it's basically a military presence in what needs to be a very demilitarized area. But again, that can't check on the quality of things. Number plate recognition can't check on the quality of things. So without the technology to check goods for standards, then people are going to have to do that. So the technology that solves the issue doesn't exist. And the Prime Minister knows this because her own people looked into it to try and find something. So the only way to keep the border open if you can't carry out checks is to make sure that checks are unnecessary, as is the case now. But that means agreeing to support the same standards. In other words, we carry on with EU rules and standards, but without a say in them. Not really what Brexiteers want, at least not since they've changed their minds since the referendum. Now, as to the tariff free trade area, that would involve, first of all, an agreement with the EU with no suggestion in the proposal of what we're going to offer to get a free trade deal. Um, it also does nothing to address the issue of standards and checks. You know, so it's not like that solves the problem that the technology can't. Like if we're going to say, OK, we're going to have a range of things. No one thing can solve all the problems. But if we have a range of them, we can solve that doesn't solve any problems. So that doesn't fill in the gaps where the technology can't do it. Um, it's just another demand they're making without actually giving anything in return. 
it's intended to sound perfectly reasonable to people who don't scrutinise their arguments. Now, there is a plan B in the Malthouse Compromise. If the backstop can't be renegotiated, of course it can't, and they're going to do what they term a managed no deal. This takes the form of keeping the transition period, but with no deal outcome at the end. The purpose of the transition would change from trying to arrange a final deal to, oh, there's not going to be a deal at all. We just want to carry on, you know, benefiting for a year or so and then crash out with no deal. But we'll at least know we're crashing out with no deal. Oh, and of course, there'll be no backstop. Naturally, that has zero chance of being agreed by the EU. Um, it's basically removing the backstop as well as any hope of having a deal ever with the EU. Um, it may just be the most retarded proposal ever to come out of Westminster during this whole sorry process. And let me tell you, that is up against some stiff competition. But this one may take the biscuit. Now, the fact that so many Conservative MPs were hailing this as a breakthrough does concern me. It concerns me about their mental capacity. It also concerns me about the future, because I was sort of thinking to myself, well, if Theresa May comes back with nothing, Parliament is sort of forced to act then. But it's going to need some of those Conservative MPs. And if they think this is a perfectly reasonable deal, then they're going to be of no use whatsoever. Uh, it isn't a compromise. It's a simple case of taking something away from the agreement that both the UK and the EU want, or taking two things away, depending on which version you use, and it doesn't throw anything back in the pot to compensate. It's just symptomatic of these people to think that a compromise is expecting people to do exactly what they say. But, you know, if it'll make it better, I will change the wording of my command. That's a concession. No! It's, it's just another example of how the Brexiteers, when they're trying to describe the EU, hold up a mirror to themselves. They try to describe the EU as being undemocratic, but it's not. But what is undemocratic are the people and the paymasters running the Brexit campaign. And then they describe the EU as dictators. Well, of course they're not. But they are. They're dictating from a minority position. They're dictating to Parliament, dictating to the EU and dictating to the world. And neither the world, Europe, nor even our own Parliament, quite frankly, if they get their way, are going to treat them kindly if they take the Brexit off and, uh, well, force us over that cliff edge. In a year or two's time, they'll not be treated kindly at all. It's the only thing keeping me sane right now, the thought of that, actually. Now, Conservative MPs such as Sir Graham Brady have suggested that the backstop has to remain in the agreement, then it has to be time limited, he says. You, you can put it in, but it has to have a, a time limit. But that is to deliberately mislead on what the backstop is. The backstop is a safety net. And a safety net isn't a safety net if you remove it before the walkers finish crossing the tightrope. Okay, so it's not a backstop at all. Then he suggested that it could remain in theory indefinitely, but with either side able to unilaterally cancel it. Well, then that's not a safety net either. So that's just as ridiculous. And, 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 and that's, a, that's it. That's all they've got. So just to summarise what their arrangements are, what they've sent Theresa May off to negotiate with, they've got five proposals. Number one, we use technology that doesn't exist. Number two, we get rid of the backstop that was considered essential by both the UK and the rest of the EU. Number three, we get rid of the backstop and the negotiations for a deal during a transitionary period. Number four, we get rid of the backstop. Or number five, we get rid of the backstop. So, plenty to go on there for a great negotiator like Mrs May. A Prime Minister who couldn't even negotiate enough votes from her own party for her own agreement. Best pack the Jaffa cakes there, Theresa. But like I said, it's not really about negotiating a deal. That's not why she's gone. It's about keeping her party together for a bit longer and hoping someone else takes the initiative in Parliament before we crash out. Or not, and just letting it crash out. Although her motivations are a little bit obscure, there are several possible motivations that could explain her actions. Her actions, just looking at it simply, do just suggest that she doesn't want the blame for any split to her party or the country, but for her purposes, more importantly, the party quite clearly. Uh, it's just a tactic of running down the clock still more. I mean, 
I may be just reading a bit too much into it. Maybe she's just gone because she wants to go back to Brussels and pick up some marvellous Belgian chocolates. I don't know. Either way, we have a pr Prime Minister basically who's scared uh, to actually lead. Conservative MPs who are demonstrating that they have no concept of what's going on. And the EU trying to salvage something against impossible odds. A no-deal Brexit just got more likely. Um, despite Parliament saying they don't accept no deal, those are just words. By their actions, they are accepting it. And they seem to be deluded. They seem to think that they can blackmail the EU, you know, with financial ruin, like a, like a mad scientist with an economic death ray. And it's not even like we can send James Bond in to sort it out because he'd be working for the nutters as well. So there we go. That's what Theresa May has gone armed with. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to click the like button, subscribe for further content, click on the bell notification, then you're notified of further content and the polls. And there's another poll that's gone out for tomorrow's video as well. Until next time, I'll see you later.